Any of you heard of the name John Wooden? Anybody heard of John Wooden? Are you college basketball fans? Uh, I grew up um, when John Wooden was at his heyday as the head basketball coach of the UCLA Bruins. And during that stretch, he won 10 national championships in 12 years, including seven straight. And some would ask, what was his secret? Uh, well, besides being a, a strong Christian person and an excellent coach, one of his philosophies was he started with the basics. From uh, some of his players, they've reported that he would open up his first practice teaching his players how to put on their socks and how to lace up their shoes. I mean, talk about the basics. That's really the basics. And when he was asked the question, why does he do that, he said, um, you see, if there are wrinkles in your socks or your shoes aren't tied properly, you'll develop blisters. And with blisters, you'll miss practice. And if you miss practice, you don't play. And if you don't play, we cannot win. If you want to win championships, you must take care of the smallest of details. And I think what's true about sports, whether it be basketball or football or other sports, you have to have the basics down. And we're continuing in our series on the basics of the Christian faith, and today we're looking at the work of Jesus Christ. Last week we looked at who Jesus was and is, and this week we're going to be looking at what he did to save us. And you know, surprisingly enough, there are many people who are confused concerning our relationship to what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. It really comes down to how you answer the question, what are you depending on to get to heaven? Or what are you trusting in for eternal life? And just as there are a lot of different opinions on the nature of God or on the authority of the Bible or on the human condition or who Jesus Christ is, so there are a variety of ways people would answer this question. What am I depending on to get to heaven? And three of the most common answers I, I wanted to look at for just a moment is, the first one is I'm depending on being good enough, doing the right things or living the right way to get me to heaven. And so the focus is on me. It's on how am I doing or what am I doing. And I know that I've talked to some people and their common view of how to make it to heaven or how to be forgiven, how to be saved is the thought that, well, somehow I got to make sure I've done more good things than bad things. And that if somehow my good things outweigh the bad things, then maybe God will let me in. Another view is I'm depending upon Jesus Christ and my faithfulness and obedience to get me into heaven. And a lot of religious people would hold to that view that I am trusting in what Jesus did, but I also know I've got to do my part and, and I've got to make sure I'm faithful and I've got to follow him and I've got to obey him, otherwise I won't get into heaven. So if you ask them, really, what are you depending on? They'd say, well, it's Jesus and me. It's Jesus, he kind of like opened the door, but then it's up to me. Um, a, a third view is I'm depending upon what Christ did for me on the cross as my only basis for getting into heaven. In other words, Jesus alone. Those are some of the most popular opinions in answering this question, and I guess throughout this message, I hope you'll be thinking about what am I really depending on to make it, to get to heaven, to have eternal life, to, to be saved. Well, we don't want to look to popular opinion. Uh, we don't take a poll and see, you know, what's 51% or more think or what sounds right, but what God says in his word, the Bible. And so first of all, I think the, the basic of basics, kind of like the putting on your socks for a, a basketball player would be, to come to God, you have to come as a sinner. You have to admit your need. And you know, that might sound like a, a basic, and of course we believe that, but you know what? My guess is you could go to churches all over this country and you'll never hear the word sin. You'll never hear that you're a sinner or that you're needing forgiveness. The fact is God doesn't save good people. He doesn't save religious people. 
He only saves sinners. And I don't know about you, but that's good news because I know I'm a sinner. Ask my wife. She could tell you. <laughs> Ask my kids. Maybe when they were four or five, they wouldn't say anything, but probably by the time they got to 14 or 15, they'd say, yeah, I can tell you a lot of things about my dad. And so for me, it's good news to know that God doesn't save good people or religious people, only sinners, only those of us that have messed up and are willing to admit it. In Matthew 9, 12 and 13, it says, On hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. You know, that was scandalous in Jesus' day. In fact, the whole context of, of this passage is that there were the Pharisees, the religious leaders, the good people, quote-unquote, were saying, why does he hang around with sinners? Why does he hang around with tax collectors? Tax collectors were kind of like today, tax collectors. They're people you don't like, the IRS people, and I hope nobody works for the IRS here, but... Uh, and I'm sure there are, good, there are good people that work for them. But, but the popular opinion was, oh my goodness, that's not who I want to hang out with. And so Jesus had to make it clear to them. He had to break it down that, you know what? I didn't come for you guys, the self-righteous, the ones that think you're okay and everything is fine and you don't need anything and you can look down on everybody else. I came for the people that know they're sick, the people that know they need a doctor the ones that know that they're not perfect, they're not righteous, they fall short, and they need a Savior. In Romans 3.23, it says, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And I remember learning that verse and learning how to share my faith, and one of the questions that we were taught to ask is, um, so does that mean I'm a sinner? Does that mean you're a sinner? Well, all is all. All of sin, all fall short of the glory of God. And so as sinners, we've broken God's commands. We've violated his standards. We've gone our own way. We've ignored his rightful authority over us. I thought it was interesting on the way to um, church this morning, I was listening to my playlist, and I, I kind of um, have gotten to the point where I don't want to pay for them, so I get the commercials with them. I don't know if you guys are like that, but my... I forgot which one it is, but uh, anyway, there was a commercial that came up about um, slow speeding, and basically it was talking about it doesn't matter if you go 20 miles over the speed limit or 5 miles over the speed limit, when you go over the speed limit, you're a risk to other people, and they gave some statistic about how many accidents happen when people just go a little bit over the speed limit, and I thought, you know what, that kind of fits with what we're talking about here. We're not talking about do you sin a little bit or do you just kind of fudge on some things. A violation is a violation to a perfect and holy God. And the bad part about it is you can't make up for your sins. You can't earn your way back and you can't even stop sinning in your own power. Have you ever noticed that? That you can try all you want, you can you know, count to ten, and you can do all these you know, little things little uh, hints or little, little things they give you to, to try to do better and you're going to find yourself constantly failing. Isn't that true? Anybody ever experienced that? Am I the only one? Uh, you just find yourself that, you know, just by myself, just by trying to be better, by, by working hard at it, by, you know, having a strong willpower um, doesn't work. And the best way, I think, to illustrate that is Talk to people on uh, January 1st when they make their New Year's resolution and talk to them on like January 6th and ask them how they're doing. <laughs> and you know what? The real disciplined people might get to March 1st, but most people will not get to December 31st because it isn't our willpower. There's something in our fallen condition that likes to rebel, that likes to fudge, that likes to cheat a little bit. And we find ourselves, even by our own standards, not measuring up, much less not measuring up to God's standard. So the response is that we must admit we're sinners in need of a Savior. 
And you know, you'd think maybe if you grew up in the church or maybe you've heard um, the Bible taught for a long time, you think, well, that is a basic. That's a basic, basic that we admit that we're sinners. But you know, some people won't do that. In fact, I, I think the popular opinion today is, I'm a good person. That, what do I need a Savior for? I'm a good person. And then, you know what usually the next line is? I'm better than so-and-so, right? And you know, it's true. If you want to pick the worst person you know and compare yourself to them and have them as the standard, probably all of us can say, I'm passing, I'm doing great, I'm getting an A+. plus." If you compare me to that guy down the street or that gal in my neighborhood. But the problem is our standard doesn't count. That's not what we're graded on. We have a different standard than God in measuring goodness. Um, I don't know if teachers do this. Some of your teachers, maybe you can tell me afterwards. Um, we used to have two ways of grading. One was called grading on a scale. And you know about scales, and it depends on where the, where the teacher has the scale, but like 90% an A and 80% a B and... 70% a C, and then, you know, kind of goes from there. That's one way. That's grading on a scale. Um, God doesn't grade on a scale. The other one is called grading on a curve. I always thought grading on the curve was weird because you take like 10% of the people get A's at the top and 10% of the worst get F's, and then like 25% get B's and 25%... Um, get D's, and then the third group is C's, and I don't even, I can't add my percentages up, but whatever's left over, th those are the C's. And, and so, you know, you may not, you may not get 90%, but you can still get an A if your whole class does bad. And that's what happened to me in trigonometry. My junior year of high school, I took trig, and for some reason, way back then, if you guys are around my age, you knew that Everybody was talking about aerospace and engineering, and so you wanted to be a, a math or a science major, and so I was. I thought I was. And tell trig. And I did really bad in trig. In fact, I've never cried before over uh, homework, but I used to cry every day with trig because I couldn't get it. And then the teacher would explain it. Yeah, I got it. And then the bad thing is they'd give us a new assignment. And then I didn't get that one. So I had like a 69 percentage in trig. And if you grade on the scale, that's an F. I think it's an F. Maybe it's a D minus. I don't know. But somehow I got a C. And I said, that's a sign from God I'm done with math. I've never had a math class again in my life. <laughs> but God doesn't grade on a curve either. He doesn't grade on a scale. He doesn't grade on a curve. He grades on the dreaded pass and fail. Except in God's scoring, it's 100% or zero. I don't know about you, that's bad news. Someone once illustrated it this way. They said if you were to compare it to baseball players, God's required perfect standard is batting 1,000 and playing every game in the field without an error. It's never happened before. There's an uncrossable gap between man's goodness and God's perfect holy standard. Um, some of you know Bill Rader. One of the things that we remember from Bill at the Men's Summit is his famous quote was, we are more like Adolf Hitler than Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but that's pretty insulting. I don't normally think of myself as like Adolf Hitler at all. Maybe his height, I don't know. But... <laughs> But in reality, when you're using God's scale, we're way closer to Hitler than we are to Jesus. And so because we've fallen short, because we're sinners, because we can't be good enough or do the right things enough or live the right way to get to heaven, we can't bridge the gap. We're in a world of hurt. We're in a miserable situation. We really don't have any hope if that's where the story ends. But the good news is there is something that God did for us. And so secondly, we must believe that it is Jesus Christ who paid the price 
for our sin. And the fact is, sin must be paid for. Jesus on the cross died in our place. In other words, he was our representative. He was our substitute. Romans 6.23, at the beginning of it, says, The wages of sin is death. That's a weird way to put it. That sin somehow pays us wages? Have you ever thought about it that way? That sin isn't just something we do, but there's a, there's a result from sin, or there's a consequence from sin. And interestingly enough, Paul in Romans says that they are wages. In other words, we receive something for it. But it's not a good thing. The wages of sin is death. In Romans 5.8, it says, God, demonst God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we're still sinners, Christ died for us. I don't know if you thought about that verse. It's one that we hear often. But there is something in the heart and nature of God that he saw us in that miserable failure condition and his love towards us says, I need to do something for them. And so that in the midst of that, in the midst of our failures, Christ came to die for us. Not in the midst of those rare, good and moral occasions in our life, but in the midst of our worst sin, God sent Jesus to pay the penalty of our sin. If sin was a deadly disease and Jesus took our disease into himself, what would happen? That's another question we are learned to or we learn to share when we're sharing our faith was if sin is a deadly disease, like say cancer, and Jesus said, I'm gonna take that disease that you have and I'm gonna put it in my own body, what would happen to you? Well, you'd live. And what would happen to Jesus? Well, he'd die, and that's what happened. He took that deadly disease of sin, and he took it upon himself. It says in Scripture that he, he bore our sins on the cross, meaning he carried them. He took them upon himself. And so our response is we must recognize and believe that Jesus died for our sins. To kind of use the example of school again, Jesus took the exam for us and scored a perfect 100. That wasn't cheating. That was okay. God says that's okay. He can take the test for you. And to put it in baseball terms again, though we can't ever bat 1,000, he did. And we can get to heaven by being on his team. That his work counts as ours. Isn't that awesome? That's an amazing thing. I've never been on a team like that where, you know, you're on a basketball team and in the scorebook, there's one guy that, you know, he scores 45 points and somehow they put that under my name. I've never scored 10 points in a basketball game. Um, but there are people that can carry the whole team. And in this case, Jesus did that for any that would believe in him. And so now, thirdly, God can now offer eternal life as a free gift. The fact is, because Jesus died for our sins, salvation is a free gift that's already been paid for. Sometimes when we think of free as being, eh, it's not really worth it. You ever get something free and you think, what is this? I mean, usually something free is kind of something chintzy, something that, that you don't want. In this case, it's a free gift that's of infinite value. And the reason is it's not free all the way around. It's free to us, but it wasn't free to God. Jesus paid a tremendous price so that it could be free for us. I think a good way to illustrate it is if I went to a store with a, a gift card that you paid for, the items that I want for that amount, they're free to me. But somebody paid for them, right? You paid for them when you bought that gift card. And in Scripture, in Romans 6.23, it says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's like God's giving out gift cards that say eternal life and forgiveness of sins. And he says, do you want it? And the question is, will you receive it? 
In Romans 4, 4 it says, Now when a man works, his wages are not credited to him as a gift, but as an obligation. And I think that's where when we started out this morning and talked about different views on what we're depending on to get to heaven, some people think of it as, well, I've got to work my way. I've got to do something about it. I, I've got to put a whole lot of effort in. and I've got to make things right. But God says, that's not a gift. That's an obligation. If you, you know, have a contract with a, a business or with a boss that you'll do so much and then the, uh, the other part of it is that he pays you so much, when he gives you the paycheck, you don't say, oh man, that's such a wonderful gift, thank you so much. No, you might say thank you, but probably you're going to say, yeah, and I worked hard for that. And that's how it is in life that some people, they want to have God be obligated to them. So they say, no, what Jesus did, that's okay, but here, this is what I did. And you know, I, I, uh, I gave all my time and I, I, I contributed this much money and you know, I, I sacrificed myself and I disciplined myself and I, I worked so hard and I'm so good. God, you need to allow me into heaven. God says, no, it doesn't work that way. Either you accept the gift or you don't get in. You can't make it on your own. And so our response is we receive eternal life by placing our trust in Christ alone and what he did for us on the cross as the only way to heaven. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4 says, For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. That's the gospel. The gospel is that Jesus died for our sins, that he was buried, that he was raised. That's the gospel. And in John 20, 31, he says, These things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So to kind of get down to the basics again, to get to heaven, we must be satisfied with the thing that satisfies God. What does God accept as the payment for our sin? Well, if you're trusting in yourself, being good enough, doing the right things, or living the right way, you're telling God, Jesus' death on the cross was unnecessary. I'll get to heaven myself with my own efforts. I'll, I'll be good enough or I'll work hard enough. Or if you're trusting Christ and your obedience, you're telling God Christ's death wasn't enough. I'll add to it by my obedience. You ever notice that on the cross, Jesus didn't say, I've helped you. He said, it's finished. Another way to translate those words are, it's paid in full. Christ didn't make the down payment for your sins and expect you to make the installment plan. He made the full payment. So if you're trusting Christ alone as the only way to heaven, you're saying to God, I accept what you did on my behalf as my only basis for a right standing with you. You and you alone are my only way to heaven. And so the verse that summarizes all of this, and if you have a Bible, you might want to turn there because I didn't make a slide of this. It's Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. It's one that's familiar to, to many of us, but it really summarizes the whole point of this message. It says in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and, it is, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. And you know, this might sound a little picky, and I, and I hope you understand what I'm going to say, because sometimes... We may believe this right, but we might say it wrong. And I'm just trying to help you as far as matching your beliefs with what you say. Sometimes I'll interview somebody for baptism and I'll ask them about their salvation. And I'll say, you know, how are you saved or, or what are you relying on? Or if you went to heaven and God said, why should I let you into heaven, what would you say? And they say, well, 
I prayed a prayer when I was nine, or I went forward at a meeting, or I surrendered my life to Jesus Christ. And you know what? All those are good things, but that isn't the basis of your salvation. It isn't the prayer you prayed. It isn't going forward in the meeting, and it isn't anything you did. It's what Christ did. And the faith part of it really isn't a work. It's just accepting that. In other words, again, the illustration of the gift card, if I bought you, and I'll make it a little bit more extravagant than what I would really ever do, if I bought you a gift card for $1,000 and I gave it to you, um, and you took it, and you went to the store, and someone said, well, how did you get that really nice whatever it is? Would you say, well, it, it was me. I accepted it. You know, I, I accepted this gift card. No. That is just receiving what someone else did for you. So our faith, our acceptance, our surrender, our going forward, whatever you might say happened at the moment of your salvation that really isn't what you're relying on. It isn't your prayer that did it. It isn't you going forward in the meeting that did it. It was what Jesus did, and you just said, yes, thank you for the gift card. Thank you for this gift. And so another question that comes up in conclusion is, if Christ did it all, why live a good life, follow Christ, and live for him? Well, in Ephesians 2.10, the next verse, it says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. In other words, that's the reason or the purpose he saved us. He didn't just save us for us to just kind of say, hey, I'm forgiven, I'm cool, I'm in. No, it's that he's got things for us to do, to bring him glory, to honor him, to draw more people to the kingdom. Someone once put it this way, he says, we are not saved by good works, but we have been saved for good works. And so our lives after we've trusted in Jesus Christ are a thank you to God. That's really all it is. It isn't that we have to prove it or that we have to earn it. It's more the sense of, I appreciate so much what Jesus did for me. I'm willing to live differently now. Romans 12, 1 says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Serving and worship are a reasonable response to what God has done for us. We don't have to be guilted into it. We don't, we don't have to feel pressure to serve God or to worship him. It's a natural heart response because we're so grateful for what he's done for us. So when we truly understand the gospel, we recognize our reliance and our trust is in Christ alone. In his life, his death, and his resurrection, we're merely receivers of what he did for us. You know what that's called? It's called grace. I want to read a, a story from Dr. Charles Ryrie's book, uh, So Great Salvation. He says, grace is a difficult, perhaps impossible concept to understand. In seminary days, I had a job working with underprivileged junior high and high school kids at a downtown YMCA. On what was then the outskirts of the city was a camp we used every Friday night when weather permitted. We would load a bus with 40 to 50 kids, head for the camp, and enjoy an evening cookout and games. On special occasions, we would sleep there overnight and return Saturday afternoon. Overnight camping trips were usually rewards given to those who had successfully passed certain requirements in our weekly Bible clubs. So the kids who stayed overnight after the, others, uh, after the others went home were rather special. One Friday night, or more accurately, early one Saturday morning, I awoke, startled by some unpleasant noise. Soon I discovered that a few of my leaders had sneaked out of the dorm, gone down to the lake, launched one of the boats, and were having a great time far out from shore. Not only was this against every rule in the book, but it was dangerous. When the kids knew I knew where they were, they came immediately onto shore. Like dogs with tails between their legs, they meekly went back to bed, wondering what punishment awaited them in the morning. For me, sleep was now impossible. The night before, I had talked to these Christian young people about forgiving one another, so as I paced the grounds in those early morning hours, 
deliberating their fate, my own words from the night before kept coming back to me and back to me and back to me. If I don't give them some punishment, I argued with myself, they will never be impressed with the seriousness of what they did. I have a responsibility to the why to enforce their rules and to punish the violators. But the more I debated with myself, talked to the Lord, thought about a number of relevant Bible verses, I discovered again that night that you can prove almost anything with a Bible verse. The more Ephesians 4.32 grew larger and larger in my thinking, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. But Lord, I can't forgive them. They don't deserve it. But neither did I. Lord, I have to enforce the rules. I'm glad, Lord, that you didn't. But Lord, if I'm too kind, the kids will think I'm weak. I never thought you were weak, only loving. But Lord, first I'll make them promise never to do something like this again, and then I'll forgive them. It's a good thing you didn't require that of me, or I never would have been forgiven. Just as God forgave me. How was that? No conditions or promises ahead of time, no works at the time, no remembrance afterwards. But Lord, you're God. You can do anything. You're my child, he said. Imitate me. So with great reluctance and very little faith, I told the Lord I would. Then in the morning, I told the kids, you did a terrible thing. It could have been disastrous consequences for yourself, your families, for the why and for me. But I forgive you unconditionally and completely. You're kidding, they said. There's got to be a catch somewhere. No, I insisted. You're fully forgiven. Then I told them what the Lord had been saying to me that night about his grace and how I wanted them to have another taste of that grace. I didn't even make them do the cleaning up that day. I did it myself because I didn't want them to think they could earn a little bit of that forgiveness. The sequel, as long as those particular kids were in my clubs, they were the epitome, as much as kids that age can be, of goodness, helpfulness, and usefulness. They never presumed on that grace. Grace is indeed a difficult, perhaps impossible concept to understand. If it was difficult for those kids to understand as an act of grace that forgave one sin on one night, how much more difficult for us to comprehend God's grace that forgives all of our sins of every day and night without preconditions, without works, and without remembrance. We can learn some important matters about grace from this experience. Let's bow our heads. Like I said at the beginning of this message, this, this is basic. This is foundational, but Maybe we needed a reminder of it. Or maybe for some here today, it isn't basic, it's new. It's exciting. Something that you even wonder, could it be true? It's so good. It's as true as the faithfulness of God and his word. That if you admit that you've sinned, that you've gone your own way, and that you don't make God's perfect mark and that you need a savior and you put your faith in what Jesus did for you you trust him as your Lord and Savior you will be forgiven you will be given the promise of eternal life and you'll be given the joy of a new life of having a relationship with God through Jesus Christ that would be my prayer and my urge for anyone that's never taken that step of faith. And for the rest of us, I, I pray that we would respond like those campers did with a, a gratefulness that would cause us to live in a way that pleases God, not because we're trying to earn our way, but because we're thankful. We're thankful for what he's given us that we didn't deserve. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the simplicity of the gospel. Thank you for your spirit moving in our heart. And I pray, Lord, that we would not only take this in, that it would cause us to worship and serve you even more, but that we'd share this with others as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Why don't we all stand together as we all sing hymn number 563, Count Your Blessings. <clears throat>